friends, I am Olivia Robertson and I'm sitting here in Clonigal Castle in my time and space to you, wherever you are in your time and space. And I want to introduce you once again to our adventures of the alchemical twins, Tara of the Oracles. The alchemical twins, which are all of us, boy and girl, old man, old woman, face the fates. And even the gods obey the fates. So we turn to the portal of the constellation of Cancer. We all have a sun sign. It helps us to understand. And we are told that this particular ritual refers to the victory. And it has a subtitle we study, the wise ruler heeds the inner voice. So let us imagine ourselves now in our temple of alchemy. The priest alchemist addresses the twin apprentices who have to go through the ordeals, Aidan and Elaine, to learn to listen to the inner voice. We need to invoke the goddess Themis, who whispers in the ear of the god Zeus. Priestess Alchemist raises scepter. Holy Themis, greater than the great, voice of the silence, be with us, and with your wisdom guide us to prepare from the new aeon. Now the people turn to a shrine in which is seated a figure wearing deep violet veils all over her. We cannot see her properly, and we realize she is a priestess oracle in trance. The oracles have returned. You have the voice of wisdom within yourselves, if you will, but heed it. Every being, every creature, is a fractal of divine souls. There is no god, no goddess, who has not a being greater than themselves in the cosmos. When divine guidance is ignored because of limited awareness, the soul is cut off from true being. More and more outer power is sought because the source of power is blocked, not by the deities, but by limited egotism. The more any individual being seeks power for him or herself, this indicates that the person however splendid seeming, is in fact weak. Those who demand love have lost love within themselves. Happiness cannot be found by any outside training or practice, or even out of belief. Be wise and happy now, and this extends throughout your time and space. My counsel is for you to create your own sacred space, which unites both heaven and earth within even the corner of a room. You will find eternity in a butterfly you release from battering itself against your window. As you gain in awareness through contemplation, you will hear my voice through the wind. Listen. Listen, listen. You will hear it through a flow of water, for you will be heating your own inner self. The priest alchemist speaks. Let us give thanks to the goddess Themis for her wisdom. The priest alchemist addresses the young man Aiden. Aiden, you often lament that the poet, the musician, the artist, such as yourself, have no real effect to help the outer world. Men are expected to be active, to direct, to make decisions and to act upon them. You may find your answer. Will you learn to act with courage by facing the challenge of the portal of cancer in the holy temple of alchemy? Aiden answers. 
If this cures me of reluctance to act, in case I may be mistaken, I'll face the ordeal. The priest alchemist says, you will have now the magic of the gods' use. He shows a Nataro card. Describe this. Aiden examines the card, head on one side. It's numbered four in the Marseille pack, number of Jupiter. It's entitled L'Empereur. An enthroned emperor is holding aloft the symbol of earthly rulership, the equal armed cross of the four elements over the orb. Emblazoned on a shield is an heraldic eagle. I notice the emperor is in the adept pose his right leg crossed over the left. Priestess Alchemist smiles. This is your emblem. As you enter trance, we will be with you, but not help you. Aid now lies down on the trance couch while all sit around him and enter trance as well. Aiden speaks after a long while in a dreamy voice. Eagerly I climb the hill to reach the temple of the Zodiac. As I draw near, it towers over me in majesty. Accompany him yourself. Climb up the hill. Climb towards the temple of the Zodiac. I had not noticed before its magnificent architecture. I enter. Come with him. I pay my respects at the altar of the goddess Vesta with her fire, which is present in all that is. All here so clear, so comprehensible this time, I quite easily find the portico of cancer. Oh, it's lovely through here. What a warm climate. This is a lovely landscape, as I imagine Arcadia. There are pleasant meadows and small hills crowned with groves. Happy young men and women in Greek costume are making garlands for some festive occasion. I can understand them somehow. A stately matron informs me that they are preparing for the choice of a new king to be appointed by the Olympians. I notice now that they are making procession, old and young, towards a dazzlingly lovely temple. Its columns are painted red, surmounted by gilded pediments. It looks like the Parthenon, but more graceful and ethereal. I ask apprehensively, are there to be animal sacrifices? There are often some snags to these proceedings. But they say I'm in Elysium where there's no death. Good. I'm led into the temple where the deities are assembled. I recognize most of them. Hermes with his caduceus, Pallas with her helmet, Hera with her peacock, and above all, the king of the temple, great mighty Zeus, the thunderer. Hermes steps forward and amazes me. He declares that I am to be the divinely appointed king, the chosen one of some island or other. Do I accept? I do. I feel I could make a sensible king with my modern ideas. I might even introduce some elementary technology. Harmless, of course, like electricity, for peaceful purposes, like lighting. I gather the island is on the physical plane of ancient Greece. Suddenly I'm held by two stalwart men of arms, their faces shielded by gold masks. I ask why. I've accepted the kingship task. I don't like the way one of them lifts his mask to laugh. Oh. I'm dragged along a tunnel leading downwards. The guards release their grip, and I find myself back in a throne room. Someone is giving me a glass of wine or a reference to my falling sickness, whatever that is. Yes, I am king. I'm wearing an uncomfortable crown that's hurting my forehead. Round my waist is a heavy jeweled belt with a cumbersome sword attached to it. There's a noisy throng around me demanding justice. There are two principal complainants, a powerful looking soldier with a black beard and some foreign looking helmet. 
He's telling me that the merchants and nobles are pushing his tribe into the sea by heavy taxes from a tyrannical government. And the other group are represented by a crafty-looking individual in rich robes holding a parchment. I'd recognize a lawyer anywhere. He's speaking smoothly. Apparently, he is financing the prosperity of the island through foreign trade. Imported goods are cheaper. I was to give the decision to be enforced by an alarming lot of guards, fully armed, surrounding my throne. Apparently, they're my relatives. Suddenly, I am determined to give judgment and act upon it. It's my chance to show what I can do. I declare that the two tribes, island and foreign, are to get together and debate the issues in a fair-minded way. Even as I speak the words fair-minded, I enter an altered state of consciousness. I am elated. The people heed my words. This is victory to give Olympian confirmation. I feel a stinging pain. A flash of light. What, what is this pain? It's hurting. It must be the famous lightning flash of Zeus. Triumphant, I find myself once more in Elysium, facing the Olympians. Congratulations, says Zeus, heartily. You've achieved success. The contending tribes have made peace. The priests have declared you a god. Now you are one of us. I'm pleased but puzzled and explain. I had hardly time to say anything. Enough, says Mercury. You're assassinated. One of your subjects stuck a dagger in your back. In shock, I awake from trance. Do I get my degree? After all, as a king, I did nothing. I'm more useful as an artist. The priestess says, that was the lesson. Do you understand it? I'll only accept a degree when I do understand it. The whole company now enter in a meditation state and send radiations of wisdom. They give thanks to the deities. This is Tara of the Oracles, the alchemical twins face to face, as you know. And we're at the Gateway 4, Porter of Cancer. And this is called Quarian and her jade dragon, and obviously adore dragons. The shadows of the deities are manifest on earth, it is said. So here we are again in the Temple of Alchemy. And the priestess alchemist is addressing the twin apprentices, Aidan and Elaine. To endure with honesty the changing faces of the goddess and the god, we need to explore heaven where they reign and earth where they cast their shadows. Are we a sort of hologram down here? We need to invoke the goddess Kuan Yin, Bodhisattva, one who are incarnates on earth, bestower of compassion, but also destroyer of evil when she is in her dragon form. This dragon was also Nu Kua, who was the creator goddess. The priest alchemist raises his star, and we realize that he is going to invoke the goddess herself, and she's seated in the most wonderful jade-colored flowing robe, delicately embroidered in gold. A priestess has folded hands, and we hope we will be granted the oracle as she sits in her niche in our Indian chapel. Holy Kuan Yin, who art adored throughout our earth for your mercy and goodness, protectress of the weak, reveal to us the mystery of your dragon form, that we may know why you are divine. A bit critical, I thought. We wait and wait and wait for the oracle. In heaven, I appear as I truly am, naked, naked light personified, emerging from the holy darkness of Aditi. When I hear cries of anguish from those who are tortured, whether human or animal, on any planet, I manifest in changing form appearing. As I descend the spheres, I am clothed in the garments bestowed upon me by suppliants. 
artists portray me as you would have me. Finally, when I descend to the seventh hell, the planetary plane of goodness and evil, duality, yin-yang, you only see my shadow. It is thus with all the deities. What appears to you as evil and terrifying is in reality overmastering delusion. You kill your enemy, yet he is not dead and returns in the cycles of time to destroy you. All you do, whether good or evil, returns to you as you pass from life to life. On the planetary level of earthly matter, your experiences are divided into that which helps you to find your true self and that which opposes your awakening. Thus, I may manifest as a dragon which destroys evil. Know that nothing that is good is dispersed destroyed. It is eternal. Evil is only what is unnecessary, and thus its energy may be transferred for further growth. In verity, goddess and dragon are one. Deities contain their shadows. Be whole, holy, Heaven and earth are one. I am at your beginning and at your end. The priest alchemist says, We give thanks to the goddess Kuan Yin for her sacred oracle. As the priestess slowly returns from trance, the priest alchemist addresses Elaine. Elaine, you find it hard to accept the existence of evil and why the deities permit cruelty and abuse, especially to the young and vulnerable, children and especially animals. Are you willing to face the ordeal of the jade dragon and so understand this mystery? Ellen replies, My need is so great I will face the ordeal. Priest Alchemist says, so be it. We shall be with you, but may not help you. He shows Elena a card. Describe this tarot card that you may enter the gate of cancer. Elena examines the card. This is the Marseille deck number 13, Le Pondu. It's like L'Empereur in reverse. I've often noticed that. The emperor has his right leg crossed over his left, as if to step forward. But the hanged man has his right leg behind his left, thus inhibiting movement. He is hanging upside down from two trees, each with six sawn off branches. However, when I reverse the card, he is perfectly happy. His left leg is balanced on a plant, not the hangman's rope. The trees now have green foliage. The colours of his suit are blue, red and yellow, with nine buttons and two half-moon pockets. As earthly power is transformed into spiritual beauty through the gateway of voluntary death. The priestess alchemist said, you are ready to enter trance. Elaine, as if long accustomed to it, lies on the couch and folds her arms across and enter trance quite quickly. Come with her. Thoughtfully, I am ascending the hill of the Zodiac. It doesn't take me very long, I am so eager to get there. I enter, and there is soft music. I look around, and I find the portal of cancer. Oh, how beautiful it is. I do see why he liked it, ain't it? It's a moon gate with the sun above it. The Chinese moon gates, I love them, with black and white alternating. Its rays of the sun reaches to right and left. On the right is a picture of a mighty ocean bordered by high-sounding towers. In the 
the sky are spaceships. On the left is depicted another ocean, and bordering it are lovely islands of golden temples and palm trees. And there are many coloured birds flying overhead. I decide I want to go through. I pass through the veil that hangs over the entrance. Come with her through the veil. I find myself in an oriental garden with hanging lanterns. There are men and women, young and old, busy creating miniature landscapes laid out on trays. I know that making miniature houses is one of the world's most popular hobbies, but feel this is pretty childish, really. I wander around and will, no one stop me. I just look at what they're doing, it's rather like a kindergarten. Ah, oh, yes, silly of me. As usual, they can't see me. Uh, am I in the future? I jump, and my thought is answered at once. A smiling young man who looks Polynesian comes up. I like his sarong, which is covered with a painting of tropical fish. But then I notice he's standing behind a Greek portico. No, a lady says, you are not in the future. Yet in a sense you are. You are in the workshop of the creators. Oh, this must be the gods. Yet somehow I thought that the gods never did any work. They just gave commands, not played around with trays. The young man laughed, he's picked up my thought. This is so on your earth, he says. Those who are rich do no work. But here, the gods work. This is the place where the blue prints of Earths are formed. Planets are, are media. You could say that planetary matter, whether biological or chemical, is our raw material. We blend it like clay into desired shapes. Then through pride and love, if what we have created is good, we infuse it with life. Oh. I'm beginning to feel a bit embarrassed at having been laughing at them. A young woman joins us. You could call us the Olympians, she says. This is Paris Athena. Or whatever you like. In Greece we use marble, which is pretty expressionless, but it was all there was. We painted our temples and statues to cheer them up, but now you seem to like them as white soap. A young man with black hair joins us. We were much luckier in Egypt, he says, indicating a pharaoh in his hand. Is it wriggling? I hope it isn't alive. Not yet, he replies quickly. It's not animated yet. Limestone presents its own mighty forms. We just drew forth what was already there, as did Michelangelo in your Renaissance. How do you get your creations onto the earth, I asked. He says, we don't. It's all there already. Human artists, musicians and sculptors carry out our visions and we obtain them from the eternal source of deity. Some humans have progressed enough to join us in direct creation. But remember, the creation is all there in past, present and future, in divine spirit. Suddenly I lose my temper. It's easy enough for you divinities to create, I explain. But what about evil, cruelty, stupidity, greed, what we suffer on planets. What a mess our Earth is in. And you lot do nothing. Oh dear, it must be because I lost my temper, but everything's gone black. I can't see. I feel dizzy and I'm falling. What's happening? I'm going down and down. I find myself in a squalid home not in what people call a developing country, genteelly, but in some European or North American city. There's a television blaring away unheeded, and a, a small boy is crouching over a computer, playing some digital game. A little girl is busy making some animals from model clay. A woman, brightly dressed for going out with heavy makeup and dyed hair, suddenly enters and drags the boy away from the computer. She hits him hard. You know Jeff won't let you use his computer, she says. When he gets back, he'll beat you. When she goes, the little boy gets a printout from the computer. I made a digital man with a gun, he says. He'll stop Jeff from hitting us. 
small girl laughs at him. He's no good, she says. He's only flat. Now look at what I've made. She holds up her clay animal, roughly daubed with green paint. This is a magic dragon, she says. She could get bigger and bigger and bigger. As big as a lorry, a big motor lorry. And then you can wait and see what happens to Jack. I'm horrified. I feel dizzy again. And find myself back in the divine workshop with the creators. Heavens, I'm in heaven. I get a shock. I recognize the beautiful young god and the goddess. Those two abused children on earth are their shadows. I come back to our temple with a feeling of amazement. I now understand that the emperor and the hanged man and Kuan Yin and the dragon are one. The lady is ecstatic. All agree she has won her degree. The company now sit and meditate, sharing reports and giving thanks to the deities. Give thanks to the divine source of mother, father, that loves us and gives us possibility of creation as their more advanced children.